Good afternoon. Let me get the set. Let me get the let me get the short people version going here. Speaking of the short people version, we'll be bringing in another short person. Well, he's supposed to be coming in next week. He'll be in Thursday. And we're going to probably try to get him to speak. I'm sure you all, some of you may remember Lewis Williams. He'll be here. He'll be with us for the feast. But we, he, we're trying to save him some money. So he's going to come in this week. He's got a ticket that he was supposed to go to a make, a, make one little, I think, last jump for the feast last year. And then after he fell with the Bell's palsy, he wasn't able to do it. But they gave him a year to use the ticket. So... Uh, sort of the least you could have done was had it come through midway, but it is what it is. <laughs> it is what it is. We'll be glad to have him. I haven't seen him in a while. And I think that he will have much to say to us. Speaking of which, how many of you um, listen to any talk radio at all? It's, it, it's pretty much a wasteland now. It started off good. It was one of those things that started off good and then they decided to use it for something else and it became what it is now. Nothing much. But every once in a while you get bored enough and uh, well, we'll flip it on and see what they're talking about. And this, from this came one of those questions that requires an answer but for some reason you just know you'll never get the godly answer for mainstream radio or television. You just know that. Not because they don't know, but because they wouldn't tell you. Because there are things that are going on there that if they tell you, you'd figure out what they are. Now, even with all that, you realize that you ask certain questions, and the people that ask the questions obviously have no idea what the answer is. They have no idea how to begin to tackle the answer. Especially when even the question itself was misdirected. Now, the question was this. Has the black church lost its moral compass? Now, the narrow and flawed scope of the question betrayed not only the lack of an answer to come, <laughs> but the inability of the questioner to realize that if you've already thrown out the map, you obviously don't know where you're going. Rendering the loss of your compass inconsequential to your question and your problem. <laughs> The problem is far deeper than pigmentation. Far deeper than pigmentation. Although this seems to be about as far as you get in America these days, no matter what you're talking about. All you hear people talking about is the falseness of race. Wonder why that is. Oh, shut up, Ray. <laughs> Although this, like I said, seems to be the biggest problem here in terms of what people talk about, it's not the biggest problem. <laughs> and it's troubling to hear people continue to talk about stuff that really doesn't matter. Unless, of course, you're going to begin to talk about the part of it that does matter. And that's where it gets interesting. That's where it gets very interesting because there's so much more going on than that. But if we don't deal with some of what's going on before soon, we're going to begin to realize the full brunt of what we're dealing with here. <coughs> we're going to get to a point where we understand that the world is in a bad way. 
not for any particular culture, but all across all cultures. There are some problems here, some of us, some of which we know about, some of which we're living through, some of which we're dealing with, but some of which we don't know because this same media tries to keep it squashed. We've got a Pacific Ocean that's full of radiation. You hear very little about it. You go to the store and you'll notice that certain, like say if you go to a heap health food stores, you'll notice that all of a sudden all of the things that are mined from the Pacific are very, very cheap. Don't buy them. Don't buy them. They're usually red tagged and the little red tag says that radiated. They don't tell you what that means because radiated is not irradiated. Irradiated is supposed to be helpful. We found out that that's not true either, but radiation means just that. It's, it's cold from an area that is under intense radiation. Therefore, if you consume these things, guess what happens to you? You glow in the dark. <laughs> or at least you've got so much radiation there that it would almost seem as if that would be the case. So be very careful. If you didn't hear it from anywhere else, you heard it. I heard that at church. That won't mean much to most people, as we saw from the debate last week. Most people don't believe anything about God. They really don't. But as I said, if we don't deal with some of these problems and begin to come together as citizens of the world, not of the United States, as well as deal with them as the people of God, the divisions of the evil one will have had their way with us and we will be mired in exactly what he wants. And it is coming. No, it's not a conspiracy theory. There will be a one world government with a one world religion. And it won't be this one just in case you're wondering. And it's God will be Satan the devil. Now, most of the world refuses to accept the true and living God as a reality. Anyone who, like I said, watched the evolution debate last week knows that the unchurched world laughs at God, scoffs at him, and offers no viable answers as to how we got here. Thus, once the spiritual problems come, and some of them are already here, by the way, man will have no clue as to a solution to these problems. Yet, answers are there, but not the ones planned by the evil one. Although some will like those answers as well, well, they will at least for the first three and a half years. <laughs> but God's answers are plain. And some of them are tough because they require us to do something. But we don't like to do something when, that's, when we can get somebody else to do it for us. Well, in this case, he's already done the heavy lifting. He's already done the heavy lifting. He died for us. So we've kind of got to do the easy part. And in terms of would you rather eat bonbons or be nailed to a stake? Your choice. But you see, as I said, God's answer is a plain but he draws them out in pieces, challenging his people to think them out according to what they have learned from his word. And how do you learn from his word? By reading it, by studying. Notice how God first draws out the obvious distinction between God and man, prophesying what is to come upon us in the end warning us in his very logical way of man's fragile nature, letting him know that you've got a choice to make. Let's drop anchor, folk. Let's go to Isaiah, the 40th chapter, the first verse. It's 
that's another one that I find interesting and want to get to one time. That's the actual layout of the final temple. And this is not what we'll be dealing with right now. This is just another part of it. Isaiah, the 40th chapter, the first verse where it says, Comfort, O comfort, my people, says your God. Speak lovingly to the heart of Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is done. Obviously not talking about now. It's pretty obvious that things are in turmoil in Jerusalem right now. But he's saying that when his time comes, your warfare is done. That her iniquity is pardoned. For she has received of Yahweh's hand double for all her sins. The voice of him who cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of Yahweh, make straight a highway in the desert, for our God. Every valley shall be exalted. That should tell us what time you're dealing with now because now you're talking about an excavation program, program that could only be pulled off by God. Filling in every valley. And every mountain and hill shall be made low, which means leveled out. So now we've got flat land. And the crooked places shall be made level. And the rough places smooth. Now this is obviously a prophecy of the return of Yeshua. Notice. And the glory of Yahweh shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. Now that doesn't mean that you'll all see it at the same time. It just means that you'll see it in the same way. For the mouth of Yahweh has spoken. The voice said cry. And he said, what shall I cry? Don't miss this. He said, all flesh is grass. And all the beauty of it as the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. Because the spirit of Yahweh blows on it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withers. Why does he keep saying this? He's making a distinction. The people is grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. His word shall stand forever, as will his kingdom. Most of us struggle getting through a week. Thus, for us, forever is a tough sell. We get back to work and things start going wrong and you start saying those words that you can't say in polite company. Because we tend to see life through the prism of our flesh. If that flesh is weak, we see ourselves in that weakened state forever, which kind of takes the gloss off the allure of forever. If that flesh is sick, we tend to be unable to see past that state of illness because you see yourself sick forever. Who wants to live with leukemia forever? Because in your mind, you know you're not. Who wants to make it forever with the pain of lupus, no one, or cancer of perhaps the brain, forever. Don't want to think about that. Thus, forever has little allure for the sick. Has little allure for the sick who cannot wrap their minds around God's plan from their state of life. For those who have money, looks, and maybe some of this world's flaccid power, we tend to like things as they are and cannot see the glory of the kingdom of God in its fullness. Because we don't want to give up what we have. He said somewhere else at another time that it would be easier for a camel to crawl through the knee of, a, of an eye of a needle for a rich man to make it into the kingdom of God. He said that for a reason. 
And then that same day, he walked, a young man walked up to him and says, what must I do to make it into the kingdom of God? He said, what have you done so far? He said, I, I, you do the law? He said, yes. You've done the prophets? Yes. He says, all right, give away everything you've got and you'll make it in. And he just walked away because, you know, it's <laughs> sometimes easier to pick up a, I, I like what, they used to, what this old guy used to talk about. He would talk about how um, the old Mayor Daly was so cheap. He said he threw around nickels like manhole covers. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. But we tend to like things as they are if you've got money. We can't see past the bird in the hand to the abounding ability to create birds and all the other amazing things that God will empower us to bring forth in any bush in the garden. Any star in the universe. Forever. Just something to think about. But with all of the frightening things looming on the horizon, it's time that we make up our minds, gird up our loins, and decide whom we will serve. Some already have. Some think they have. Some don't realize that the choice was made improperly before we ever found out about it in terms of how we, how we live in this world. I think it was uh, Rungren that said he talked about being trapped in a world that he never made. Yet, a thorough study of God's word will correct those errors. We simply have to decide which choice we will go with. And we can't make it as a group. There's not going to be like you ever watch the old uh, conventions where you'll see the state of Texas over there and you see the state of Illinois over there, you know, the ones picking their pockets. Um, it's not like the kingdom. It's not going to be like there's going to be a flag over there that says ABCOG and we all get in just because we were here. Mm -hmm. Or that one says CGI because they were all here. Or that one says the Methodist Church because they all were there. It doesn't work like that. We simply have to decide which choice we'll go with and understand that once our time comes, it will be an individual decision. <clears throat> but there will be, as always was in school, as it will be in life, there will be little tests. Won't there, Cornell? Mm -hmm. We get little tests from time to time. Like, which one will you choose, Easter or Passover? Sabbath or Sunday? Law or rebellion decide, disguised as grace? Valentine's Day, the Pope in Lupercanus or the love of God? Christmas or the true holy days of God? Please know that these decisions were being winked at for a time. But the time is fast drawing to a close that God looks and says, ah, it's okay. Paul warned the Greeks of this at Mars Hill. Let's go to Acts, the 17th chapter, the 26th verse. Acts, the 17th chapter, the 26th verse where it says, and he has made all nations of men of one blood, which I think puts that whole race question to bed right there. Has made all nations of men of one blood to dwell on all the, earth, all the face of the earth, ordaining four appointed seasons and boundaries of their dwelling. To seek the Lord, if perhaps they might feel after him and find him. Or in other words, just you might look up and find him. Though indeed he is not far from each one of us. Matter of fact, if you could see dimensionally, you might find that he's sitting right next to you, smiling. 
or at least an angel might be, sitting right next to you, smiling at you. And you can't see it because you can't see dimensionally yet. 28, for in him we live and move and have our being as also certain of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Then being offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like gold or silver or stone engraved by art and man's imagination. Truly then, God overlooks the times of ignorance now. But now he strictly commands all men everywhere to repent. Because he has appointed a day in which he is going to judge the world in righteousness. By a man whom he appointed, having given proof to all by raising him from the dead. And by that statement alone, you know exactly who I'm talking about. We talked about it in the Bible study this morning. What would happen if he had never done that? <laughs> now... With this warning shot across the bow from Paul, and this shot, understand us, came before 60 AD. That was a long time ago. That was a long time ago. So man has had nearly 1,900 years to figure out what God wants from us. We who have been baptized and have been given his Holy Spirit should not be waffling. We should know that we have been sanctified. We have been set apart for a holy purpose and been given a sign, a sign that tells the world who we are and tells God what we feel about him. Note the sign that we have been given. Let's go to Exodus, the 31st chapter, the 13th verse. Exodus, the 31st chapter, the 13th verse. Speak also to the sons of Israel, saying, Truly, you shall keep my Sabbaths. Note, it, note that it's plural. Now, when it's plural, what does that mean? It doesn't mean just the Sabbath, but it also means the Sabbath and the holy day. Truly you shall keep my Sabbaths, for it is a sign, a what? It is a sign. What is a sign? That's a little sign of sorts. Not many signs in here, I noticed. Well, there's a little placard over there. But a sign is also something that is an indicator between two people. There are little signs that you see now between people all the time in terms of little handshakes and things that they do. But this is the sign, what does it say for it? It is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. That means for a long time. To know that I am Yahweh who sanctifies you. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy to you. Everyone that defiles it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work in it, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Now, of course, with him dying for us, we can repent of things. That doesn't mean that you want to keep doing it, though. You don't want to keep doing it. By his death, you get a little leeway on that. You can repent and do some work around it, maybe work with your employer to get to where you don't have to do that anymore and get away from it. Whereas before, bump, you do it once, you're done. That's what his death did for you. Gave you a little wiggle room. Doesn't mean you wiggle forever. Only worms do that. We're not worms. 15. Six days may work be done, but on the seventh is the Sabbath of rest 
holy to Yahweh. Whoever does any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the sons of Israel shall keep the Sabbath. Who are the sons of Israel? The spiritual sons of Israel would be us. Therefore, the sons of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as long as you shall live. And if you pass it on to children, as long as they shall live. If they have children and pass it on, as long as they shall live. For an everlasting covenant. What does that mean? 17. It is a sign between me and the sons of Israel forever. For in six days Yahweh made the heavens and the earth. And on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Oh, wait a minute. I, I, I missed that. Uh, is there somewhere else you can find that? Oh, sure. Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, the 12th, 12th verse. Oh, maybe he was wrong. Maybe, maybe you know, we don't have to keep the law. We don't have to keep the Sabbath. Oh, yeah. Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, the 12th verse. And I also gave them my Sabbaths. Plural. Bing. Wish I had a bell. Wish I had a bell. <laughs> and I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between me and them, that they might know that I am Yahweh who sets them apart. Got anything else? Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, the 20th verse. Ezekiel, the 20th chapter, the 20th verse, where it also says, And keep my Sabbaths holy, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that you may know that I am Yahweh your God, and also, by extension, the rest of the world will know who you belong to. Mm. Who you, how did uh, Ben and Bernie Mac say, who you with? <laughs> who you with? <laughs> the sign that we belong to God is what? The Sabbath. Yes, the Sabbath. And the holy days. This, <laughs> I don't know if y'all figured it out yet, but it makes us stand out. <laughs> Which brings us to today's question in our title. Which one are we? Marked grass or signed saints? Just a question. Which one are you? Who are you with? Are you marked grass or signed saints? We have to decide, and not only do you have to decide, but we have to live according to that decision. Not just one day a week, all seven. Because just as God has set a sign upon us, guess what? Satan and his cohorts have set a mark upon everyone that doesn't have that sign. Hmm. You see, the ensign is already there. And a choice can still be made. The pressure was there for a time and that pressure is dissipated. It's more peer pressure right now and pressure from jobs, friends, family others but a day is coming when a physical choice will have to be made we don't like to talk about this and we know it but the fact of the matter is we love many of the folks who are putting this pressure on us and there's nothing wrong with that because it's family that's doing it to a large degree Although we don't always love everybody on our jobs, but, oh, I didn't say that. But I understand it. 
But they're putting this pressure on us, and that's what Yeshua meant when he said, be careful, in Luke, the 14th chapter, the 26th verse. Luke, the 14th chapter, the 26th verse, where it says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life, ooh, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. Christ elaborated a bit on this in Matthew 16 when Peter challenged him when he told his disciples that he would soon die in this cause, setting an example for all of them. And in time, if you read, they all did. Matthew, the 16th chapter, the 20th verse. Matthew, the 16th chapter, the 20th verse, where it says, Then he warned his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Yeshua the Messiah. From that time, Yeshua began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and from the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him saying, God be gracious to you. Lord, this shall never be to you. Was he saying it because he didn't want it to happen to him or because he didn't want it to happen to him? Hmm. 23, but he turned and said to Peter, go, Satan, you are an offense to me. For you do not savor the things that are of God, but those things that are of man. Then Yeshua said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life shall lose it. And whoever desires to lose his life for my sake shall find it. Ooh. For what is a man profited if he shall gain all the money in the world and the financial system collapses and you never get a chance to spend a dime? What is a man profited if he shall gain all the gold stolen and hidden in Germany? But you can't ever put a value on the money because, gee, there's bigger rocks of gold and rock and meteors and stuff coming down from heaven and maybe I should go find a hole because this money, you can have that, I'm going to go hide, I, I, I can't do it. What is a man profited, bottom line, if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? He said somewhere else, don't worry about those who can kill you and bury you, but <laughs> worry about the one that can kill you and then follow you into the grave and kill you forever. Paraphrase, but you get my point. This is not to say that we're not to care for our families. God left much leeway for that. What Christ is saying is that the things that our families want us to do in unity with them, which are not of God, we cannot allow them to pressure us or shame us into doing them if we know they're not of God. Understand our time of decision is now. We know what the sign of God is. We know what the law is. We know that God teaches us through this law how to live holy. It has been our schoolmaster throughout. 
Moreover, what did Christ tell us? John, the 14th chapter, the 15th verse. John, the 14th chapter, the 15th verse, where it says, If you love me, keep my commandments. What does he mean when he says keep? Obey, live by, do all that you do according to my commandments. John, the 14th chapter, the 21st verse. When you see something repeated this much, don't you think that there's some importance to it? He who has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me should be loved by my father. And I will love him and will, re and will reveal myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself to us and not to the world? <laughs> Yeshua answered and said to him, if a man loves me, he will keep my word. Implication is the world isn't doing that. Sometimes, like as I said once before, you've got to read between the lines as well as to read the lines because he's saying something even by what he does not say. Yeshua answered and said to him, if a man loves me, he will keep my word. Why? Because he asked before that. He says, you revealed yourself to us, but why not to the world? He says, I've done that. They don't listen. They don't care. They think that they've got a better deal. If a man love me, he will keep my word, and my father will love him. And we will, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. Write that down somewhere. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. In other words, it comes as one, whether it comes from the Father or it comes from me. We're on the same page. We're doing the same things. We're writing the same book. We're writing the same play. We're living the same life. We're doing the same thing. So if you hear from one or the other, you're not going to hear one from one and something else from the other. It's going to be different. It's going to be the same thing all the time. It's different when it comes from somewhere else. Be aware of that. 25, I have spoken these things to you, being present with you. In other words, I'm right here. You got questions? Come on and ask. What does he say again? 1 John, the second chapter, the third verse. 1 John, the second chapter, the third verse, where it says, and by by this we know that we have known him. Here it is again. If we keep his commandments. He who says I have known him and does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in them. But whoever keeps his word truly is in this one the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Let me tell you something. We cannot fail in these last days because theoretically we've got the truth. So there's not going to be a second chance for us. <laughs> we go back, it almost seems like that question isn't even important anymore, doesn't it? When it was asked the way it was, it's not. So let's try something. The question was, and let's rephrase it in a more correct manner in order to go forward. Has the church lost its moral compass? <clears throat> no. I'd say they surrendered it. I say they threw it away for pottage, for porridge, for a cookie, for a dollar, 
for a chance to get on TV. I'd say they surrendered it. But long before modern times, you see, it seems that the world and God's people have always had a tenuous relationship with the law and the word of God. The fall of Adam and Eve came from doubting God and trusting Satan going all the way back into the Garden of Eden. So this is no new thing. The Israelites constantly disobeyed God, were enslaved, cried out to him, were rescued, disobeyed God, were enslaved, cried out, came back and were rescued by him, disobeyed God, were enslaved, cried out to him, were rescued, and reverted again and again and again and again and again to the pagan practices and sins of the nations surrounding them. Well, gee, were they stupid? No, they were human. Deuteronomy, the 12th chapter, the 28th verse. Deuteronomy, the 12th chapter, the 28th verse, where it says, be careful to obey all these words that I command you, that, I, that it may go well with you and your children after you. Forever. In other words, this doesn't just apply to us. It applies to our children and their children and their children's children's children. Of course, if any of us are looking around, we know that this is probably, if not the last, one of the last generations that will see terra firma, if you will, as it is known. That it may go well with you and with your children after you forever. When you do what is good and right in the sight of the Lord, your God. When the Lord, your God, cuts off before you the nations whom you go in to dispossess, and you dispossess them and dwell in their land, take care. Take care that you be not ensnared to follow them after they have been destroyed before you, and that you do not inquire about their gods small g implied s their gods saying how did these nations serve their gods that i also may do the same you shall not worship the lord your god in that way for every abominable thing that the lord hates they have done for their gods for they even burn their sons and their daughters in the fire to their gods, such as Molech. You want to really get scary about something? Grab some of the old books. And if you've got, if anybody's got Esau, it's in there. Just look for Josephus and find that little <coughs> golden chair that they had for which to sacrifice their children to Molech. It was a golden chair with arms stretched out for the baby. You bring your child and you sit it in, that, in the cradled arms of this golden chair. You give the signal and a little blast of fire would come up and roast the child. And they somehow thought that this was pleasing to God. Oh, they were terrible people, right? Not trying to upset anybody, not bringing any bad memories, but when you go into a sexual situation and not prepare, of course, preparation basically means that you wait till you're married. We won't even get into it, but all I'm saying is this when you get married, you do what you write. But people don't, and sometimes they get pregnant. You go in and you have an abortion. Are we familiar with them? We passed a law back in 74 that said it was perfectly legal and okay. And we thought that because it was okay, that wow, we can all go out and do it. I'm not saying that the people that did it were the worst people in the world. You made mistakes. That's why he died for us, to repent of them. Not talking about you, just talking about what I'm talking about. When you go in, yeah. A needless shot in there. 
a little solution is shot in there which kills the baby. And as I understand it from the test that they do, the baby burns mm. mentally. It, hurts. it feels like pain. And then they take a knife or what they, a suture and do what they call a DNC, where they chop the baby into little pieces and suck the baby out and throw it away. Now, where in the eyes of God is the difference between doing that and putting the child in the arms and letting fire come up and roast it. The child is still dead. And you think you've done something to help. In the, in the case of those folks who did that to Molech, they thought that they were helping themselves to become rich and become enlarged in life. And you hear women say all the time, I did it because I had to finish school. A baby was going to keep me down. Oh, I wasn't ready for marriage. I wasn't ready for this. I didn't even like him. Oh, da, da, all that. Ancient Israel did it repeatedly. So does modern America. Then ultimately, they followed their errant leaders and clamored for the execution of Yeshua at Calvary. No good has come to them since, and not much has come to us. But you see, a remnant will repent to Yeshua in those last days, and many are looking into his Messiahship even now. May we pray for those to come that do this. You, I read all over Jerusalem, there are little groups that are trying to explain to these people, and believe me, this is dangerous to do this. It is dangerous to go into Jerusalem and even say the name, much less Yeshua. Even if you go in there and say Jesus, you might get stoned. But people are doing it, and people are hearing it, and people are coming to Christ. But the rest of the world's Christians seem to be unsure if they want to follow God or follow the world. <laughs> How do we know? We dress like the world. We think like the world. We watch the world's television shows. We listen to their music. We let our children listen to it. We read their books. We read their magazines. They read their blogs. And the results are horrifying. But as I said before, with no map to a moral life, how can we ever hope to live one? The churches of the world say that God's law is done away. As I said, you surrendered your map. You threw it away. How will you know which way to live if you don't have a schoolmaster, if you don't have the law there to teach you? How do you know? You don't know. The churches under Catholic sway say that they have the authority to change the law. Notice this from the Vatican. There was a little doctrinal thing that they used to hand out to all of the Catholics when, with the catechism. I'll give you the date later. But they would send out, with to, and this is what they would hand to children. Show you how, they, how this works. They say that it's just the media that does it now. No, it's, it's an old thing. What, what does even the Bible say? Train them up in the way that, they want to go, that you want them to go. And when they're old, they will not stray from it. Media does the same thing. So did the Catholic Church. The Q&A is found in the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. And it reads just like this. Question. Which is the Sabbath day? Answer. Saturday is the Sabbath day. What? Keep going. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer. We observe Sunday because instead of Saturday, because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea in 8 AD 336 transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. Question. Why did the Catholic Church substitute Sunday for Saturday? Answer. 
The church substituted Sunday for Saturday because Christ rose from the dead on a Sunday. We've heard this before. And we didn't hear it from Catholics, okay? You heard it from other churches. So don't say that you don't have protesting daughters. Please, they don't sound like they're protesting very much to me. Sound like they're walking in, in lockstep. Because Christ rose from the dead on a Sunday and the Holy Ghost descended upon the apostles on a Sunday. Well, at least that part is true. Pentecost is always on a Sunday. You see how they play with it? But it gets worse. Question, by what authority did the church substitute Sunday for Saturday? Answer, the church substituted Sunday for Saturday by the plenitude of that divine power which Christ bestowed upon her. This has been out there. This one was published in 1946. For those who think that they just started. Now, there's another one. Found in a doctrinal catechism. This is what they would hand to the kids when they would take them to catechism. You've got, I'm sure some of you have had friends. I had one that, I won't tell that story. <laughs> that had catechism every week, every day. Question. Have you any other way of proving that the church has power to institute festivals of precept? Answer. Had she not such power, she could not have done that in which all modern religionists agree with her. She could not have substituted the observance of Sunday, the first day of the week. Ooh, what arrogance. They just come right out and say it. The first day of the week for the observance of Saturday, the seventh day. A change for which there is no scriptural authority. Reverend Stephen Keenan, this one came out in 1851, before the Civil War. And there are others where they claim that they have the authority, and their authority outstrips the authority of the word of God. I don't know how anyone that has read this book, but then again, I can't get upset. Because let's understand, there was a veil over their eyes. And also, up until, oh, what, the 40s or 50s, the book was in Latin. If you couldn't read Latin, you didn't know what they were talking about anyway. So don't get all haughty and, oh, they're so, uh -huh. They got sold to build the goods just like a lot of us did. We didn't start here. <laughs> we didn't start here. I was in a Sunday church for years. <laughs> Once you start asking questions, you know what they do? Punt. They will kick you out. Yes, they will kick you out. But as testified in these old documents, the world has gone along with these changes, although the word of God is quite clear on this action. The Pharisees would change laws according to their Talmudic teachings in likewise manner. And force Hebrews to keep them. Yet when Yeshua upbraided them with, his, with words, they tried to kill him and eventually did. But what's fascinating is the words he Challenge them with. Let's go to Matthew, the 15th chapter, the 7th verse. We'll recognize this. Matthew, the 15th chapter, the 7th verse, where it says, You hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And they even changed the order of the commandments, removing number four and splitting ten and nine into two parts to cover it up. 
This is how the, what, what, what we'll do just to make it clear, we'll read the law of God as it is in the Bible, and then we'll read it according to the way it was changed by the papacy. Number one, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Hmm. Papacy, you shall have no strange gods before me. Two, thou shalt not make any graven images. It's not there. Wonder why. There was a great, I watch, listen to some country music sometimes, and Lyle Lovett had this song where he would say, um, I don't listen to this, I don't do this. And the, 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 if you know how the, the song was recorded, it says, I don't go for fancy cars. I don't go for, and then there's the line, the next line is movie stars. He had married... Um, oh goodness, what's her name? Um, Julia Roberts the week before. So he says, I don't go for fancy cars, diamond rings, or, and then he just walked away from the mic. And everybody in the audience cracked up because he had just married a movie star. <laughs> Thou shalt not make any graven images. Two, nothing there. Anybody that's ever walked into a Catholic church anywhere in the world knows exactly why. There's nothing there but icons. But they did slip something in for two. You shall not take the name of the Lord in vain. Three. Torah. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. What? Three, there are three. Keep holy the Sabbath day, although it is now called Sunday. Wow. <laughs> and then they, it adds, says, do no unnecessary work. In other words, if you got to work, you work. Mm -hmm. So where is it the Sabbath? Number four, Torah. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days shall you labor, but the seventh day of the Lord your God do no work on that day. Four. <laughs> For the papacy. Honor your mother and father. Five. <laughs> Honor thy father and mother. <laughs> this is something. Papacy, five, do not kill. Six, do not commit adultery. Six, seems to have caught up a bit. Do not commit adultery. But notice that two just kind of went, boop, disappeared. I wonder if, um, ah, never mind, I won't bring him into it. Eight, Torah, do not steal. Shortening these to shorten it up. Eight, do not bear false witness. Nine, Torah, do not bear false witness. Nine, do not covet your neighbor's wife. That's papacy. And then notice they split nine into two parts. Ten, Torah. Do not covet your neighbor's house or wife or anything that is your neighbor's. Ten, do not covet your neighbor's goods. Nine, do not covet your neighbor's wife. They split it into two commandments to cover that they got rid of the one against idols and icons, and for the Sabbath. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. I don't even know what to say, but just say, well, if you're Catholic, <laughs> you got something to do. You got work to do. Because of this religious chicanery, most of the world's Christians believe they are keeping in part any part of Sunday 
and it's okay. And working if they're unable to get the day off. This has spiraled the world into an endless run of sin against God's law and rebellion against the laws of man. And don't think that people don't think, well, if there's no law for God, that I don't have to. <laughs> How many of you have seen people just boldly run red lights? Used to be you would see them like if it would go yellow. Oh, it was yellow. No, I've seen people stop, look and see it clear, and run right through the light. It does not matter anymore. And if you think that it doesn't, if it just happened on the street, go into corporate America. Look at how much money is being stolen. We're in rebellion. But you see, keeping God's true law is his sign for his people. But consider this. There also is coming a physical mark. Let's go to Revelation, the 13th chapter, the 16th verse. This blew my mind when that, for years in the churches of God, we ran around looking for the mark of the beast, and it was already there. and had already been given. Revelation, the 13th chapter, the 16th verse, where it says, And he called it all both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. That's the thing I think that's going to get most people that for the first time in, in human history that there will finally be a chance where the rich have just as much chance to get their head chopped off as the poor. People are going to like that until they realize, oh my goodness, that's not from God. Oh no, that's from Satan. Yes, it is. And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. 17, that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that has understanding count the number of the beast for it is the number of a man and his number is six three score and six and what I find fascinating that they constantly talk about a, a system of money that will be completely transacted on the internet you, you transcribe the word internet or world wide web and it comes up six 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 I found that interesting. Didn't throw my computer away, but it, under, it made me understand exactly what's going on in the world. Once all of this cashless society goes online, mm -hmm. you're, it's very easy if, you're having, if you don't have that mark for them to just cut off your internet service. Mm -hmm. Guess what? You can't buy or sell. You can't trade. And we, oh, it's so wonderful. Oh, wow, we can shop at Nordstrom's. We can shop at Marshall Field. We can shop at Target. And some of us, we can shop at Walmart and never leave our beds. For everything good that comes, Satan will find an evil use for it. Never forget that. But contrasting God's sign and seal in the minds and lives of his servants, note what is said of Satan's mark. The mark in the right hand and the forehead implies the prostration of bodily and intellectual powers to the beast's domination. In the forehead, by way of profession, because you think and therefore you're thinking that way, so the mark is in your mind. In the hand, in respect to work. You work for it, or guess what? You can't buy or sell. Many now, as with God's law, are saying that it's okay. I read it, I think it was in one of the little Church of God circulars that gets around. I, won't, I, don't, I can't remember the name of it because I don't read it anymore. After that, I saw that ad, I was done. It basically said, you know, just, it's okay to take the mark of the beast. God will, see if you've heard this before. 
it'll be okay. God will know your heart. And you will be okay. Well, what does the Bible say? It's already said, anyone that takes it, you're done. And what that basically implies that not only are you done, but if you're going to take it, deal with it honestly. If you go out now, you've already been given a sign, and you get given a sign, and now you go and take a mark. There's a word for that. James, the first chapter, the fifth verse. And no one will be shocked when they hear the name for that. God calls them double-minded. James, the first chapter, the fifth verse, where it says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and with no reproach, and it shall be given to him. But let him ask in faith, doubting nothing. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven by the wind and tossed. For do not let that man or woman think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, not dependable in all his ways. Not some, all. If I can't trust you, how can I bring you into my kingdom? James, the fourth chapter, the eighth verse. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, sinners, and purify your hearts. Double-minded ones. We must make up our minds to either live by the sign we have taken or in fear take Satan's mark. You can't do both. And all indications are that when the beast comes into power, which it hasn't yet. I'm not saying that everybody that's in the Catholic Church now can't run for the hills tomorrow and find their way to God. The marginal line has been drawn, but it hasn't been crossed yet. There's still time. There is still time for all those who have heard these things and couldn't make up their minds. There's time. But time is short. And let us also remember the decision that we live in today, if we die tonight, you die in that decision. We often forget that. But you can't do both. And all indications are, as I said, when the beast comes into power, time's up for making up your mind. Because he will make it up for you by force of if you look at, if you go back and study Catholic history throughout time, they've always done it by force. They've even, they even invented grandiose ways of stocks, guillotines, uh, all kinds of torture devices by which they would torture you until you gave in to them. I get really nervous when I hear things like saying that the U.S. military has bought some 5,000 guillotines. Wonder what they did that for. Almost a half million rounds of uh, gunshot, I mean, uh, bullets for gun, handguns and now for snipers' guns. What are they going to do with all that? And who are they going to do it for? It certainly doesn't have anything to do with the U.S. Constitution, so you got to assume that at some point, Probably when the financial system falls, so will this country. And at that point, that's when I believe the beast will rise. It's time for us not to wait for that day too late. It's time right now to stop the waffling and make up in our minds that we're going to go into this age with our courage intact and our faith strong. Because if we do that, God will protect his own. Even if it means that you wake up protected in the next life, you know that you will be protected. Because we also know that when the trumpet sounds, we come up with Christ first. And as bad as it sounds, it's going to feel mighty good to put this.
this system down for all that it's done to all of the people for so long. Bring on the kingdom of God. God bless you all.